Welcome to the Fish Casting Podcast. I'm your host, Tanner of Fish Facts TV on YouTube, and this is... Hey, everybody. I'm Captain Strip, and you can find me on Instagram. All right, guys, we got a good show for you today. Again, we're sorry um, for the inconsistent schedule lately, but hopefully over the holidays, we're both going to be around, um, and we should be able to get you some more consistent content the next couple of weeks. We might try to go a little longer today just because we haven't been putting out as much content as we'd like lately. And again, um, I'm gonna have a lot of time the next couple of weeks, but good, a good show today. Um, we, I did some great fishing. Tim's gonna talk about some other important elements of fishing. We got some questions and we got a good fish of the week. So let's get started. All right, Tanner. Now, uh, I know you just mentioned that you did some fishing this week. Uh, I, I think you traveled a little bit and, and did something exotic. You mind telling me about it? Yeah, Tim. Um, I actually got a pretty unique opportunity. Um, I was in New Orleans to see some friends and I got um, a friend of mine that I, I, cause I used to live in New Orleans. I don't know if I've said that before. I used to live in New Orleans. So a friend of mine who I used to fish with when I lived there, um, we were just talking, catching up and he was like, yeah, you know, if you're going to be in town, come out of my boat. His boat's actually in Biloxi in Mississippi, which is an hour and a half east of New Orleans. But, you know, I used to go out with him a lot when I lived there. Um, mostly when I've gone with him before, we've, uh, we've gone offshore or Red Snapper, and we've even run out to the rigs off Venice and Chase Tuna before. So I was like, yeah, absolutely, man. We were really hoping, uh, like I mentioned in the podcast, like about a month ago, to get on the tuna and we had a, a weather window that was supposed to be about 36 hours. Um, and as we started to get closer, the weather window started shrinking more and more and more. And so by the time we actually got there, the weather window to go offshore had shrunk to about six hours. So um, a little bit disappointed in that, but you know, he, I don't go back there very often, obviously with COVID, I really don't, that's the first time I've traveled in eight, nine months. So he was like, you know what, we, we have a six hour window, we're gonna do something with it. So he told me the, the sheep's head had been running um, in that part of Mississippi recently. So I was like, all right, let's do it. Um, so we go there, first thing we got, three dozen shrimp, which when sheep's head fishing to me, that struck me as not enough bait. And I was like, are you sure three dozen shrimp? And they were pretty cheap uh, over there too. He's like, ah, no, that's, that's all we need. I was like, all right. So we, we get out to this spot and it's literally just uh, the way it is over there. There's like these little barrier islands and we pull up to this marker. I don't know what kind of marker it was, but it had like a huge grate under it. Like if I were to draw a sheep's head spot, like, even though it's technically in the Gulf, it was a real shallow bay type um, area, literally like maybe 300 yards from the barrier islands. So you, we were right off the shore, but the barrier islands there are like pretty far off. Um, there's like the, the sound, I think it's called the Mississippi Sound uh, is pretty wide. So, you know, we were a couple miles from the main like town area. Um, so we went in there and anchored up, got a perfect anchor about 20 feet up current from this marker with a big grate on it. And he was like, all right, let's get some sheep's head. Used basically the same rate of weight uh, rig I've been using, a little like Carolina type rig with about, a, I think we were using a quarter or a half ounce um, with a swivel and about a foot, foot and a half. So not a, not a ton of leader um, and a small, I think we started out with two aughts, but we realized the two aughts were too big. Uh, we downsized to one aughts, um, started losing shrimp uh, immediately. So what I decided to do and what I've done with sheep's head fishing with other places in the past was instead of using the whole shrimp, just use part of the shrimp. Um, and so we just started drifting back and sure enough, the, the sheep's head were there. And, you know, fishing for sheep's head is, is pretty nuanced. I don't know, like I did it a little bit in Jacksonville growing up. I've done it some in Tallahassee, but, you know, they're, they're very particular on what they eat. A lot of times you need to have fiddler crabs, but I guess uh, in Mississippi, there's just so many of them. I don't know 
something about the ecology there. Um, just there's a, a lot more sheep's head like volume. You know, I guess they do catch a lot in Jacksonville certain times of the year, and but there it just seemed like I'd never seen sheep's head fishing this red hot anywhere. And we fished for about an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes, and we caught 10, I want to say, um, eight keepers, seven keepers, maybe seven. We, we had a couple throwbacks, uh, but we were just using little one inch um, to one and a half inch uh, little pieces of shrimp. And actually what was crazy was the heads. Usually, you know, when I'm using pieces of shrimp, I throw the heads away. But for these sheep's head, for some reason, the heads were actually working the best. I don't know if the head looked more like a little crab. Um, my friend theorized that maybe um, the, cause there's a lot of little pinfish and a lot of little pig fish that we were catching as well, mixed in with the sheep's head, that they had a harder time eating the hard head where the sheep's head just crunches right through it and, and it doesn't make a big difference. So we, uh, we filled up the box with sheep's head and uh, we decided to move on to offshore fishing after, you know, we decided eight was a good amount. We could have tried to catch more, but you know, we, we had plenty of food to take home. Obviously um, I was able to cook some up that night, but I, it wasn't like I could really take any home. You know, we got a couple for his family and he took a couple back to New Orleans with him. Nice. Now, now, Tanner, I know you got more to talk about. I'm, I'm just curious about uh, the type of boat this guy has. So you're doing kind of the inshore barrier island sheep's head fishing, and then you're able to diversify and cruise offshore. Can you talk to me a little bit about his setup or? or yeah, he's, it, he's, he's got a, he's got a 26 Cobia. Um, okay. I, I don't know if it's a Bow rider is how I would describe it. So there's a little bit of walk around up front and there's a small cabin. You know, we've taken this boat all the way, like 150 miles offshore. So you can, you know, there's enough for probably two people to sleep uh, in the cabin. So it's not the boat, I would say that's designed for sheep's head fishing, but we were able to anchor <laughs> and just basically the, the well deck was right there facing this marker. So, and you know, the way the current was running, we were just dropping our baits straight down and then the current pulled them back towards the marker. And it, it was, you know, obviously not the boat most people would use for sheep's head fishing, but the way uh, we anchored, you know, it was, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Yeah, it seems like it worked out. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that using the pieces for sheep's head, because that's something when I've sheep's head fish in, in the past, I, I think using pieces is critical. The smaller the bait, you know, pretty much as small a bait as you can get on to fit on your hook, they're just so precise and they're, they're so good at thieving your bait. They just nibble around it. Um, I find that those small halves, quarters of shrimp or just really small shrimp with, with small but very stout hooks, that's always the, the, the kind of sliding scale of how small a hook do you want to use because they have those mouths that can kind of uh, go around the hook very easily but they're also filled with those really rock hard teeth. You know, they eat crustaceans. Um, so their teeth are, are insanely um, uh, just hard, they're solid. So it, it can be tough to hook them. So I usually find that, that there's some um, mustad uh, varieties of hooks. It's a 9174. It's a very strong, but um, very, it, it, it comes in a small package. It, um, as far as I'll use like a one or a two and, and use those small pieces of shrimp for those uh, sheep's head. But um, I think you're right, you know, that it's definitely an art form to catch those sheep's head um, because they're just so darn tricky. And yeah, yeah, I actually talk about kind of when you're fishing for sheep's head, how it is a balance, you know, you, you want a small hook, but you're also worried about, and then when you're fighting them too, you really, you know, they say like, um, speckled trout, some people call them weak fish because they have small mouths. You know, it's not like a largemouth bass when you go to get a good largemouth bass and a good hook set, you could pull it in with a winch. You know, you really have to be careful. And I think I lost two or three of them too, um, where your drag is heavy enough to prevent them from pulling back into the structure. Oh, sorry, my nose is uh, tickling. Um, pull them out of that structure where you originally got them, yet soft enough to where, you know, it could be hooked by a little tiny piece of skin in between those hard teeth. And it, it is a, it's a delicate dance that you have to make. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, 
it's definitely interesting. I, I don't do a whole lot of uh, sheep's head fishing um, here in the, in the West coast of Florida, um, they're really only uh, targeted in the winter time. So kind of now-ish, you know, we're in the middle of November through February. That's when they all start getting ready to spawn. And you'll see if you, if you dive down at any of our uh, local bridges or rock piles, there'll just be hundreds of them down there. So um, they, they definitely congregate to those um, kind of highways and those, those zones a lot more in the winter. Plus they're more apt to eat the shrimp. Um, uh, you, you kind of lose their appetite. They lose their appetite for shrimp in the, in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, that's when like the fiddler crabs and other, other crustaceans really come into play for them, but I just don't target them enough. And, and if I was going to, it'd be about this time of year. So I think, I think you hit it at a good time. Yeah, it was a great window and we took advantage of it. And yeah, like I said, I can't remember the last time I've targeted sheep's head. I mean, that may be the most keeper sheep's head I've had in, in a day. You know, there's probably days in Jacksonville where we've caught four or five, like all day, but to catch, you know, 10 in an hour, an hour and a half is, you know, it, it was red hot, you know, like, cause like I said, we're catching uh, pinfish and pinfish too, you know, you're getting hit instantly. And then, you know, the question was, uh, what were you going to get? Yeah. Now, do you know what the uh, recreational limit is on sheep's head in, in Mississippi in those waters by any chance? It's it's 15 in Mississippi. 15. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if it was 15 per person or 15 per vessel. Um, but like I said, we, we stopped short of it um, because, you know, that that nine to one was the window to run offshore. And we fished for sheep's head until about 945. And then uh, we decided that the, the bite had slowed down a little bit the pinfish and the pigfish were getting more active. And, you know, we still think that if we would have had more shrimp and we would have stayed there longer, we could have caught more sheep's head, but we started catching more of the nibbler fish and less of the target species. So uh, that's when we decided uh, we were gonna try to run offshore and see if we could find any uh, big mangroves or groupers. Yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to hear your offshore uh, part, but I, I agree with you. I think three dozen shrimp is uh, not nearly enough for uh, targeting sheep's head. I probably brought double that or more um, just because of how crazy they are at, at just picking your bait off. You can lose your baits constantly. So I agree with you there. All right, so uh, I'll get to part two of the day. So uh, we leave the sheep's head spot feeling really good about it. And we, we decided that everything after that was gravy. Um, we really wanted to go try and get on the grouper. Um, so obviously I hadn't fished offshore there in a while. And every time we've gone offshore there for, um, we've either gone for tuna or we've gone for red snapper. So I've never caught any uh, grouper there before. Um, and we haven't gone for reds. I haven't fished with them probably in three or four years. So it's been a while. Uh, so this was like literally the, the closest rig to shore where we were going to. And there was also um, an artificial reef that was near the rig. And this was in, I wanna say 65, feet deep. So it was, you know, maybe an hour 15, an hour 20. They got two uh, Suzuki 150s that they just put on their boat. So they just did a repower on her. Um, so, you know, it was probably 18, 20 miles offshore. Um, it was a little bumpy, but they were long rollers. Uh, so we get to this spot. We also, you can buy croakers at the bait shop in Mississippi, which is not something that I've ever seen before. Um, so we had about a dozen croakers and we'd caught about a half dozen pinfish while we were catching sheep's head. So we had about 18 uh, baits to drop on the bottom. And like, we only had about three hours, um, maybe two and a half once we got out there. I dropped a uh, pinfish down to this artificial wreck and got my bait stolen within seconds. Um, so we, we do one more drift over this same, uh, artificial rack and it was, it was the same thing. We didn't know what it was, but whatever it was, it was very aggressive and it was taking our bait. So finally, my friend, after the, after I got stolen twice, he drops down there, pulls up a red snapper, um, almost immediately. So we go down and we do another drift on this bottom and we both get tight at around the same time. He gets his up. It was another about, you know, and these are good size red snapper, um, 20, 22 inches. 
And then I hook up with something huge. And I was using their tackle, so I wasn't exactly sure what pound test it was, but I had it pretty tight. And man, I was fighting this thing for over a minute. I was like, what on earth is this thing? It's fighting so hard. And I pulled up what may have been the biggest red snapper I've ever caught. Um, thing was probably in the in the neighborhood of 20 pounds. Um, nice. Just a huge, a mule is what my dad would have called it growing up in Jack's. Huge red snapper. Um, but, you know, we all have our own red snapper issues. And one thing I do like, because a lot of times in Jacksonville when we're not targeting red snapper and they're out of season and we're catching them anyways, we're fishing deeper water. So when you're letting them go, you know, you have to use a release device, you know, they're struggling from the barrow trauma. Here, we're fishing in 65 feet of water. I let that red snapper go and they're off to the races. So it, mm -hmm. it makes you feel a lot better about catching an out of season red snapper when you know that you know, it didn't seem like there was a lot of sharks and the, wa the water was very shallow. So those snappers were able to get right back down to the bottom. So after those three snapper, we could see the rig, you know, probably a mile, mile and a half away from the bottom where we were fishing. Like, all right, well, maybe we can try to pull some mangroves off that rig. Unfortunately, we only had about six shrimp left at that point. Um, so we got up there, we put on a yellowtail jig, just like I've been fishing here for yellowtails. It was a little heavier yellowtail jig than I would typically use for yellowtails, um, you know, but it still was that same type of yellowtail jig I know you're familiar with, maybe mm -hmm. um, a quarter ounce or something like that. Threw it with a shrimp, threw it right up on one of the legs of the rig, hooked up in about 20 seconds, pulled out about a 13 inch mangrove snapper, uh, first cast. So that, that made us feel pretty good about it. Threw another one on, red snapper. Threw another one on, red snapper. Until all of our shrimp were gone. Um, it seems like after I caught that first mangrove initially, the reds seemed to have gotten the memo. So we went around the other side of the rig um, with our other shrimp, uh, I think with our last shrimp, and I pulled out about a 10 to 12 inch trigger. Um, I didn't have service, so I wasn't sure how big triggers had to be in Mississippi or even if they were in season. So we decided that we were just going to let the trigger. It didn't look like if I would have caught it here, I don't think it would have been a keeper. So yeah. uh, we, we decided to let it go. Um, and then we had all those croakers. So I thought maybe cut croaker would be good. Um, maybe that would help us get on the mangroves. And it didn't. It was... <laughs> Those red snapper, I've never seen anything like it. Like we've gotten into red snapper pretty thick in Jacksonville, especially now that there's, um, you know, there's so many of them, but we were just drift. It was like fishing for yellowtail. We're literally hook up a chunk of cut bait, drop it down there, except instead of yellowtail where you wait like three or four minutes until you get back to them and you're chumming, there's no chum. You count to 15 seconds and a red snapper was on that cut bait every single time. No weight, you know, I, I grew up fishing for red snapper with big heavy weight. This was free line. And by the time we caught like three or four of them, I could see them in the water chasing my bait up to the boat. These, you know, some of them are smaller, 14, 15, as big as like, I probably caught a couple 20, 25 inches just chasing it. it. It was crazy how many red snapper there were out there. Um, but we obviously assumed that they were out of season because, you know, red snapper issues. And actually, on the, so we gave up, we ran out of bait, you know, we had that small window. So we started heading back and I was looking on the fish rules app and it said that red snapper were open in Mississippi. Um, so I did a little bit more research and it turns out we were right to throw them back. But apparently the way Mississippi manages their red snapper, which is something that I really like and I, I wish Florida would adopt is basically if you're fishing for red snapper, you have to have their red snapper app and all the information. Mm. You have to create a voyage in the app before you even go fishing. And so that's how they manage their weight quota because every recreational fisherman fishing for red snapper. So I guess they had just said the season was closed. They just blasted it out through their app. But because we didn't have the app, we didn't know that. Uh, but I talked to his brother, we figured out, we made the right decision, obviously letting those fish go. But uh, I, I thought it was a really inter interesting management tool. So thereby, there that way, you know, because good science needs good data and to regulate any fishery, especially one as uh, contentious as the red snapper, you need good data. 
And if you are requiring every single red snapper landing to be put into an app, I think one of my issues with this data with red snapper is there weren't enough, uh, there wasn't enough data. So people were conflating a small amount of uh, catch info to a large population and uh -huh. just say, you know, 10 boats went out and 10 boats caught 20 fish. That means if there's a thousand boats, they caught um, 2000 fish. And, you know, do using that sort of math. And while I, I do think there is some, some um, benefits to that, I really like that system Mississippi has in place. And I would really like if Florida, obviously Florida, I think Mississippi has 65 miles of coastline. So it's a lot different in yeah. Florida, but, but I do think that that is a good idea. And if it is something that we could adopt here in Florida, I would be all for it. Yeah, it's, it's amazing just how ubiquitous those red snapper are in the Gulf of Mexico and, and for so long, for so many years, how few you get to keep. Um, I do like the idea of, of fishermen, red snapper fishermen um, doing the app. I, I think it's um, somewhat derived from, uh, you know, I'm a hunter and I hunt primarily in Alabama. So I'm going to use some anecdotal uh, um, reference here. You know, if you when you buy a hunting license um, for the state of Alabama, now they're doing it in Florida, and I know a number of other states. If you end up harvesting a white-tailed deer or a turkey, you have to report that in the in an app, similar to um, similar to the one that you're talking about for Mississippi. That way, the Department of Natural Resources for Alabama can track how many deer are actually harvested that year. Um, if you just went on how many hunting licenses you sold, both in state and out of state, plus the amount that you're allowed, your, your limit for the year, that number would be completely different skewed. Um, so for example, last year, I didn't, I didn't harvest a buck, but I could have harvested three bucks. So if, if the state of Alabama took, took my potential harvest rate versus what I actually did, it'd be way different. And now uh, multiply that over how, however many thousands or tens of thousands of people. So I think we're on the same page. Um, I, I think it would be, like you mentioned, very difficult for the state of Florida to do it just because how much larger it is. But I think with enough resources, um, it can happen pretty easily. There's some, some very smart people that can design and, and build algorithms and apps and, and make it happen. And you, you know, they say garbage in, garbage out. And I, I think the opposite of that is good data in good policy out. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. I know that those fisheries scientists at UF um, are smart guys and they have the ability to make good policy. Um, and I think that having better data is just would be key to that. I know we had a question back uh, a couple months ago about red snapper and our thoughts on the red snapper fishery. Uh, in general. So we won't go, get any deeper to that today, but that's just kind of like a, a little bit topical of our thoughts on an issue that is obviously uh, complex. And it's, it's separately, you know, Mississippi Gulf waters is more similar to Florida Gulf waters than Florida Atlantic waters. They're um, governed by separate bodies. You have the Gulf Regional Fisheries, what is it, the Gulf Regional Fisheries Commission or whatever, and then the South Atlantic Regional Fisheries Commission. So those federal stocks are regulated differently uh, in the Gulf and the Atlantic, even though Florida obviously has um, coastal waters in both. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, I don't want to call it a mess, but there's a lot going on with the, how the fisheries are regulated uh, between state and federal and everything. And that's, that's a rabbit hole we can go down for a long time. <clears throat> Absolutely. All right, Sim, well, you had uh, some other, some maintenance boat stuff you wanted to talk about? What, what, what can you tell me today? Yeah, uh, you know, I feel, I feel like there's been so many um, times recently I haven't done a lot of fishing. I haven't taken my boat out. Um, so what I have been doing when, when we've been having these, you know, bad weather days is, is I just wanted to talk, to talk to our listeners and talk to you about just general upkeep. You know, I'm, I'm a, a primarily a, a boat fisherman. So um, anytime you're on the water, obviously we're both proponent of safety and, and keeping safety first, but just keeping up with your maintenance. And, and that goes for the watercraft you're using all the way down to your rods, your reels, your tackle, your line. So, so what I've been really doing a deep dive into is, is I'm transitioning from the, our summer and fall month style of fishing into the winter months. So 
coming up, I'm going to be really targeting some ledges for hogfish. Um, I know that I've talked at, at length about targeting hogfish hook and line. I think it was fish of the week a couple months ago. But um, I'm, I'm changing up my game. I'm making sure I have plenty of jig heads. I'm making sure I have plenty of those yellowtail jigs like you're talking about. I'm going through and inventorying everything I have. I'm checking my line, making sure I have plenty of 20 pound test leader, 25 pound test leader, checking my line guides, um, going through greasing any of my reels, checking to make sure that they're functioning correctly. So anytime you know I don't go out because of weather or commitments, I try to go through some of my equipment, um, starting with the boat, making sure that everything is in tip top shape. Um, these boats, they wanna be run. So mine, I'm fortunate enough to have on a trailer in my driveway. So at any point in time, I can go out there and I can check the systems, make sure I'm not getting a battery drain somewhere, making sure I'm not um, leaking oil or, or any anything. You never know what can happen with these boats. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I went out to check my electrical system uh, two weeks ago. I turned the battery switch on, went through um, checking all my different switches for my lights and, and different pumps and aerators and powering up my uh, GPS and radar and everything. And I found that uh, since it was sitting for a month that my windlass, I have an anchor windlass, it wasn't functioning. So now it's time to troubleshoot. I start at the switch and I work back to the solenoid and then I go to the motor. And it took me a half of an afternoon between going, uh, getting my multimeter and figuring out what exactly was the problem and putting it all back together and going to West Marine to buy the part. It ended up being my solenoid. So if I wouldn't have checked that before I went out maybe for an offshore trip, I would be stuck out there trying to fish uh, in potentially 80 to 100 feet of water without an anchor. Um, although that's very doable, I do like to drift. Um, but this coming, this time of year, I generally like to, to hammer on the anchor. I'll, um, like I mentioned, hogfish. I can't wait to get out there. But uh, I, I'll, you know, I can't say it enough. Uh, keeping up with maintenance and just checking your gear is critical. Starting with your safety gear, down to your fishing equipment, your boat, et cetera. Um, I have a hunting trip coming up in a month. I'm already starting to go through all my hunting gear, making sure that everything's good. So it does uh, uh, cross paths. And um, if you're stuck inside because of bad weather and you can't fish, check out your gear, do an inventory, make sure everything's good to go because you don't want to miss an opportunity because your gear is faulty or something breaks the next time you go out. Yeah, there, there's nothing worse than losing a fish or, you know, having a, a trip ruined over something that you could have checked before you're having some sort of maintenance issue. But it's really awesome you have a, an electric windlass like that. I, I, I've always, you know, my dad has a trolling motor with a GPS lock. So whenever we go with him, we have that. But whenever I'm out with the boat club boat, you know, it's me or one of my buddies pulling up that anchor from 70, 80 feet. And that can definitely get uh, a little bit taxing. And it's also really awesome that you have the knowledge to fix that windlass yourself. I know uh, a lot of people would just have to take it in uh, to their local boat mechanic and pay an arm and a leg to have them do the troubleshooting and find out, you know, that it was that solenoid, whereas you had the ability to troubleshoot it yourself, you know, kind of zero in on that issue and then, you know, do the electrical work. Um, I know electrical work especially can scare a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, I would be lying if I told you that I didn't think about bringing it in a couple times just because I'm a, I'm a very large individual. Um, I'm six foot six. I'm close to 300 pounds. I'm a big guy. And working in these very tight environments is, is highly taxing on someone, um, especially because, you know, I got these big hands. I'm trying to work in tucked in areas. It just, it's aggravating. Um, I, I almost threw in the towel a couple of times, but I know I saved hundreds of dollars by doing it myself. The part alone was, you know, close to 200 bucks. And you know, if me, a non-professional, worked on it for five or six hours, I'd have to think that a professional probably would take two or three to do it. Um, so, you know, I don't know what the average rate is for, for um, boat mechanic in right now, but I'd have to say probably over a hundred bucks an hour. So I'll, I'll take getting my hands dirty and a little bit of discomfort and fixing it myself over bringing it in. Plus, you never know how long it'll take them. They'd probably sit there for a month before they started working on it. So 
I was happy to get that done. And now I know my windlass is working perfectly. Yeah, hopefully uh, if I end up coming to town, you know, I got a lot of time off school uh, in the next couple months. I could maybe sneak over there one time and try to get on some hogfish with you. That would be mm -hmm. uh, a lot of fun to get out there. You know, I've, I've, I've heard about this Tampa hog fishing, but never, never got to experience it myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to get out here very soon. Um, it's just, it's just the weather. Anyone that turns on the news right now, we've had a crazy hurricane season. Um, it's been blowing 30 knots over here every single day for, uh, you know, if I had a calendar, I'd be marking every single day with an X. Just, it's, it's been awful. All right, man. Well, uh, let's get to the next thing. And today that is our fish of the week. Tim, can you tell me what the fish of the week is? Yeah, this week we got the pig fish. Uh, you mentioned that you were catching some. Um, what do you know about it, Tanner? The pig fish, Orthopristis chryso chrysoptera. Um, it's in the family Hamlidae. Um, which is the grunt and sweet lips family. So the thing is in Florida, a lot of people think of grunts kind of as, you know, the white grunt, they all have that big mouth, but the grunt family, the, the Hamulidae, you know, a lot of the grunt relatives in the Pacific are called sweet lips. So they, they have just the big lips. And so I think the pigfish looks a lot more like um, a lot of those Pacific uh, sweet lips uh, that they have in like the Great Barrier Reef and all that area than it does like most of the grunts that we have here in Florida. Um, I catch a lot of pig fish. Like most grunts, I kind of consider them trash fish. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've used them for bait before, but I can't put my finger on a specific fish that I've caught with a pig fish's bait. Um, obviously, if nothing else is biting, a lot of times they are, um, you know, they're, they're one of those little pecker fish kind of along with pinfish, um, silver perch, we get a lot of in Jacksonville, you know, those four to eight inch fishes that are, you know, kind of trash fish, but you know, if it's a rainy day and you got nothing else to do, catching them isn't the end of the world. Uh, what, what insight do you have on the, the pig fish? Yeah, yeah. Um, if everyone remembers back to our first episode of the this podcast, uh, I went on a rant about how much I love pinfish. Well, to me, a, a pigfish is up there um, equal with the pinfish as far as bait quality, maybe even better. Um, you mentioned they're in the grunt family and, and they're called pigfish for a reason. They, they grunt at you. They kind of have a, 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 um, a throaty guttural noise that they produce. I think that when they're stressed out and, and you hook one as bait and you send it down for snook or group or whatever, they're down there stressed and they're grunting, which then the predatory fish can key into and, and kind of uh, triggers a strike. That is my opinion, um, but I think they're great for bait. Um, they're very hardy. You can cast them a number of times. Um, they can get hit. You can use them as cut bait. You can use them as live bait. Um, hook them through the face, hook them in the back, hook them in the belly. Um, I think they're an excellent fish. Um, they're generally uh, the type uh, uh, bait fish that swims to the bottom. So you can free line them down to, to grouper and, you know, 80, 100 feet of water, they're going to swim down. Um, so they're, they're very similar to the pinfish. Um, I like them just as much or um, maybe a little better than a pinfish for bait. But other than that, I, I know some people can eat the bigger ones, but um, I don't think I've ever eaten one. Um, I'd try it, but you know, I, I get enough good fish that I don't need to eat them. Yeah, probably like any other grunts, you know, I know some people eat grunts. I personally don't eat grunts. Um, I honestly don't know if I've ever caught one in Miami. I feel like I might've caught one, but I feel like they're a little bit more of a cooler water fish. Um, like there's a lot of them in Jacksonville. Obviously, Mississippi is much cooler um, and Tampa is a little bit cooler. So, you know, I, I don't think there's much of the tropical. Uh, they're more yeah. of like a, a temperate. Um, so, like, I feel like I've caught one since I've lived here, but not in the quantities that you'll see them uh, a little further north. Yeah, you know, just to touch back on it, you know, I've been doing some thinking while I've been talking on it. 
if I went into my live well and I wanted a bait to use and I scooped up and there was a, a three inch pig fish and a three inch pin fish, pretty much no matter what I'm fishing for, I'm going to choose the, the pig fish over the pin fish. So I think I like them a little bit better than the, the pinners for, for bait, which is saying a lot because pin fish are excellent bait. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting to hear you say that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the fish of the week. We, we got two questions. This is actually from a couple weeks ago, but uh, we held on to it. So we will get to that. Um, the first question is from the Almighty Bape um, on Instagram. And his question is, how long have you been fishing for? Um, so I'll answer that myself. I want to say... I was two. There's a picture of me with a bluegill when I was about two years old fishing. Uh, there's some lakes at the University of North Florida, which is pretty close to where I grew up. And uh, we used to have like picnics there as a kid. And my my dad would take me um, with my little Snoopy rod and some dough balls. And he got me started fishing bluegills. Um, you know, I feel like I, I fished almost exclusively bluegills. We do some, I have probably some mangrove snappers off the dock if we were in the Keys or something. Um, but I, I know my first few years of fishing was primarily bluegills. And then, you know, when we were fishing offshore in Jacksonville, I became the uh, sabiki master, um, you know, catching a lot of cigar minnows, um, you know, for, for a lot of my childhood. But, you know, I, I've been fishing pretty consistently but I really, really started kicking it to another level, probably in around ninth grade um, when I started fishing for bass myself. And that's where I kind of, you know, as a kid, you know, your fishing identity is kind of tied to what your dad does, or maybe it's like an uncle, a grandparent, or like a friend's dad, but you're obviously you can't drive. So unless you live on a body of water, you know, you, you kind of have to do where they put you. Um, so in ninth grade, I had a bike, I could ride everywhere. I really kicked up my bass fishing. And then as soon as I turned 16, um, I started getting into the redfish and flounder and trout. So, and, and the rest is history. Uh, what about you, Tim? Yeah, real similar. I can draw a lot of parallels. Um, you know, some of my earliest memories are fishing with my older brother and my dad and my grandfather. Um, you know, I, I think I was going on fishing trips and on the boat well before I could walk when, when I was in, you know, um, a stroller. But, you know, when it comes to actually fishing, um, you know, I don't really remember those times, but very similar stuff, just targeting, you know, little gronkers, little stuff, bluegills, snappers off docks, off, um, you know, lake shores, things like that. Um, but but the, the big parallel to me, it's funny, is, you know, growing up, um, we lived in a neighborhood where there were some bass lakes nearby and my brother and I would ride our bikes constantly you know any minute it seemed like we had some time to go out we would go fish for those bass and then as we got older you know we were very fortunate my brother and I um, in 1998 to get a, a small skiff and um, my dad would drop my brother and I off uh, at the boat ramp in the morning and we would be gone by ourselves all day long and he'd pick us up at five at night. This is before we had cell phones, before any of that stuff. He, we would just we would just go. Um, a little different world, you know, uh, from back then to now, and 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 just from a safety standpoint. But you know, uh, just starting off really fishing hard um, on the bike for bass and getting that boat, and then you know just continuing to hone my skills and into where I'm at now. Um, it, it's been a long run, and you know, like we've talked about a number of times, we're constantly learning and. Uh, you know, it's definitely a passion. So I, I love to be able to do it. And I think I'm going to fish as much as I can for the rest of my days, hopefully. So start and end and, it that way. And one thing um, I think that you learn, especially when you're fishing as, as long as either of us have, is a lot of the skills can be applied in different ways. You know, maybe you pick up something here in one fishery. And then like Tim was just saying, you're always experimenting. You can take that um, and apply it to another fishery. I, I think when I was in American Samoa, it's a great example because, you know, I grew up my whole life fishing in Florida and um, 
I basically was starting from scratch. And so it was trial and error for months until I was able to kind of refine those techniques. You know, trolling Yozuris is what we used to do fishing for tuna in the Keys. And trolling Yozuris ended up being my best method there, um, fishing for the little Samoan mackerels and the dog tooth tunas. And, uh, and then bottom fishing, I just started making um, chicken rigs, but the hooks were too small. So I started using chicken rigs with bluegill hooks for trigger fish and, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, trial and error, applying other methods. And uh, yeah, so lifelong fishermen, but also it's never too late to start. I don't want anybody to think that just because, you know, maybe you're 16, maybe you're 35 and you never had that parent or brother that was really um, pushing you into fishing like we did. It doesn't mean, I think right now, especially YouTube is a great, not to toot my own horn, but if you just want to learn how to fish from nothing because you never had that parent or friend to show you, you can learn a lot on YouTube and just start from scratch and just watch videos on the different types of fishing you want to do. And, you know, it may take time, but, you know, th that's one of the reasons I like to make videos because obviously I'm experimenting, I'm learning fishing Miami, but um, it can be, it can be really good just learning uh, from watching YouTube videos. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, you're never too, too old or too young to start, you know, uh, it's something that pretty much anyone can do. And, and uh, I recommend it. It's like I said, it's a passion of mine and I'd love to see more people get out there and enjoy something that I care about so much. All right, last question from Mocha Louie. Mocha Louie asked, what's more exciting to catch, peacock or redfish? And presumably uh, peacock bass is what he means there. Yeah, um, you know, I'll jump in on this one. It, it's pretty easy for me. I don't have really access to peacock bass where I'm at. So that one that one to me is, is redfish. Um, in Tampa Bay, redfish are um, pretty abundant. There's a number of different places you can go. Um, they're pretty much everywhere. Um, I really like redfish. They're not my favorite, but I think I think it's more exciting just because um, you never know kind of how big or how small, depending on the season. You can get some really really big ones. Um, so for me, it's redfish 100. percent Yeah, peacock bass to me are just such an odd fish because they're 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 not they don't really like fight like a normal freshwater fish, but they also don't really fight like they don't. You know, bass are great. You can always use a plastic worm. They readily hit artificials. Peacock bass, like you said, you prefer artificials. Um, but also redfish are different too. You know, I have caught redfish in Jacksonville, which is what I really cut my teeth on um, fishing in high school. You know, we we worked for every single one of those redfish. You know, the one little creek I had access to with my little, uh, my friend's GNU or my little, uh, pond tracker bass boat, you know, a, a good day fishing back there was like four or five redfish, but you'd get, you get a 20, 26, 27 incher in skinny water. And that, that's an awesome fight. You know, I've not caught uh, many big peacock bass, you know, I've caught a couple, three, four pounders and they fight hard, but it's not the, the runs of uh, those, those good, slot redfish but um i, I mean I, I think they're they're fun in a different way um i just don't think that I, I i do think i prefer redfish now of course in louisiana there are some places where catching redfish is like catching bluegills and there's so many redfish yeah. you just catch them so maybe we'll, we'll refer it to florida florida redfish um and and i would say i i would go with redfish but by a pretty slim uh, margin yeah, that, that's fair. Um, that's definitely fair. You're right about Louisiana. Those things are everywhere. You, speaking of YouTube, you can see some pretty crazy redfish videos on there. All right. Well, uh, that's all the time we got today. Thanks for tuning in again. Um, we're going to get a guest eventually. I promise you maybe in two more weeks. So next week we got our pre Thanksgiving episode Hopefully we'll both be available to record then. Um, hopefully the weather will cooperate. I'm hoping to get the boat out um, Tuesday and maybe even Saturday. Right now, Saturday looks a little rough, so it might be a sandbar day. Um, 
And I, I also went jogging today and saw some mullets. So I think tomorrow I might do a little uh, little check and see if the, the pre-sunrise snook are there. There you go. Well, I can't wait to hear how you do. And, and uh, I'm just praying for some some ease up on these winds here and maybe I can get out and provide some some fishing stories. It has to it has to stop blowing this hard soon. All right, Tim. Sounds good. Have a have a good one. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye.